Um, so next speaker is Marc uh, Toutant, uh, who will be speaking from SNRS Paris, who will be speaking about subsuming Turkic <coughs> poetics into the literary canon, two Central Asian treatises about Arus. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. So, sorry. So, okay, two important phenomena influenced the course of the cultural and intellectual history of Central Asia, multilingualism and the evolution of a literary style. Arabic was an intellectual lingua franca, Persian and also later Turkic were the languages of belles lettres. If authors were multilingual, the texts they produced were conventional. During the Timurid period in the 5th century, a poet writing in Turkic was expected to use Persian thematic materials. By the 15th century, both Persian and Turkic poets used the Arabic quantitative system of metrics rather than syllabic systems basic to their own languages. In becoming a literary language, Turkic assimilated the generic system of Arabo-Persian literary and practice. There are three major texts that deal with prosody or Aruz. The first one is the Funun al balokha composed by Ahmad Hudaydod Tarazi. The second one is Mir Alishir Naboi, Mizan al -Azan. And the third one was written by Babu, the founder of the Mughal dynasty in India. Today I will focus mostly on Naboi's treaties. Mir Alisher Naboi has been revered as the promoter of the Tagatai Turkic literary language in a period where the language of poetics was Persian. But in the same time, Naboi is also considered to be the major pacifier of Turkic language and literature because of his extensive views of Persian words and because he was instrumental in making Persian classics the models for his Tagatai Turkic literary production. His treatise about Arus was designed as another means to integrate Turkic literary genre into, into the framework of Persian poetics. But before we examine how Nabawi used a prosody treatise to do that, let me remind you of some of the issues facing Turkic poets with the Arab system. Central Asian Turkic language does not recognize vowel qualities, vowel length and brevity or accent as rhythmic elements. So the traditional prosody of the Turkic forms before the adoption of Aruz, called Parmak Hesabe, finger counting or Hece Vezni, syllable meter, was based on the number of syllables in a line and on repeated groups of syllables separated by keseras. On the contrary, Aruz is a quantitative prosody devised by the Arabs and perfected by the Persians. Rhythm is created by the alternation of long syllables and short syllables, grouped into feats of various length which are combined in standardized rhythmic lines. This prosodic structure was essentially ill-suited to Turkish phonology. Harus meters have a preponderance of long syllables, whereas Turkish makes frequent use of short vowels. Three successive short syllables, for instance, can be used only at the end of just a few meters, and no meter can accommodate four successive short syllables. This incongruity forced poets to distort the pronunciation of hundreds of Turkish words in order to fit them into the molds of the meters and to borrow a huge number of Persian and Arabic words with long vowels. Arabo-Persian rules and tradition were introduced regardless of the fact that they did not fit the Turkic language. Turkic poets dealt with many difficulties in order to keep the rhythm of Persian poetry while versifying in Turkish language. In his guide to prosody, Mizan Alauzan, which principally explains how to 
apply classical Arab-Persian prosody to Turkey, Nabawi does not talk about such difficulties. In the introduction, Nabawi writes that although there are many works about Arus written in Persian and Arabic languages, there is no such work in Turkic language. And that is why those who want to write in Turkic do not benefit from this knowledge. That is the reason why he wrote this treatise. More specifically, this treatise shows that Nabawi pursued two objectives. On the one hand, he wanted to improve the current system of Arabic Persian Aruz, and on the other hand, he wanted to include Turkic poetic forms into this system. In fact, although Nabawi wrote this treatise in Turkey in order to show that Turkic poetic form were worthy of being part of the Arus system, his subservience to Persian canons and models is obvious right from this introduction. Among his sources of inspiration, he mentioned several Persian authors, such as Nasir al-Din Tusi, Shams Kreis, but also his friend Jami, the great Persian poet, who also wrote a treatise about prosody. And one can easily see that Nabo's treatise was modeled on Jami's work. So, Nabawi did not only want to raise Turkic poetry to the rank of Persian poetry, but he also wanted to enrich the traditional Arabic and Persian system of Aruz by adding various elements. Here is what he wrote about that. Your humble servant has extracted from the principle of the science several rules, circles, and poetic measures that were not included in work about Aruz such as the books of the founder of the science, Khalil ibn Ahmad and Shams Kais, the master of knowledge, and Hoja Nasir Tusis, Miyar Arashar. <coughs> but also in the book about Arus composed by my master, Jami, May God Brighten His Tomb. I added them to this book. Nabawi states that there are eight basic feet or rukt that, po that poets use in Arabic poetry. Among these eight, fit, Nabawi is careful to note that five are more used in Persian and Turkic poetry. Likewise, in the section devoted to the hofat, the shortening of certain long syllables, Nabawi only deals with those that are widely used in per Turkic and Persian poetry. If Nabawi therefore set himself the task to enrich the Arabo Persian the Arabo-Persian system of Aruz, his way of proceeding reveals that he's primarily concerned with bringing Persian and Turkic prosody closer while disconnecting the Persian system from the Arabic one. When Navoy discusses the different meters of Bach, he goes into great detail descri describing which among the 90s meters which are more used in Turkic or Persian poetry, and which are more used in Arabic poetry. Then it creates two new circles, in addition to the five that already exist. You can see the Bari in This creation are designed to identify and gather the meters that are more specific to Arabic poetry, and those who are more specific to both Persian and Turkic poetry. So, having brought Turkic prosody closer together with the Persian system, Navoy then focuses on some specific feature of Turkic poetry. He goes in great details explaining how Turkic words should be scanned. And at the end of the section devoted to the meter and the measures, Vazn, Nabawi discusses several poetic forms that are specific to Turkic poetry. Nabawi is the first prosodist to do such a thing. I quote him. Since there was no rule and regulation for the Turkic language that has been verified, and since nobody wrote a book or a treatise in the science of Arus for the progress of this science, that is why I decided to write a treatise for the rule of this science. 
Nabari lists several Turkic poetic forms. For each of them, he gives both formal and functional or pragmatic elements. Uh, for instance, while talking about the Tengi, Nabari writes that Turkic people sing it during wedding ceremonies. This is a pragmatic element. And he adds that this type of song, surud, which is very pleasant, is of two kinds. The first kind does not fit the Aru system. For the second kind, a bait is written in the meter, Munseri Marfi Markouf, and they use the word yor as a radif. Here is an example. Kaisa Chamandin Asep called Saba Yor Yor Ki Demedim Tushtu Ot Janamara Yor Yor. As you can see with this example, Navari did not want to maintain two separate systems. For the Turkic poetic forms, he adopts a metrical specification within the Arabo Persian Arab system of metrics to replace their original Slavic specification. Therefore, he sets up a sort of unified, non language specific system for generic categories. A case in point is the way Nabari deals with the Tuyurk. The Tuyurk is today regarded as specific Turkish poetry. And in another work entitled Muhakamat al Rate, Nabari acknowledges the genre to be specific to the Turks. It was first composed in a Slavic meter of 11 syllables. The, four, the first formal definition of the Tuyurk was advanced by Nabari in his Mizan al Auzan. Nabari refers to its popularity among the Turks, particularly the Chagatai people, as a meter in which song, songs are composed in their gatherings. Of necessity, a Tuyurk must contain two baits, one, two, and its meter must be Ramali Musaddasi Maksur. It is mentioned that a desideratum is the use of Tajnis, or homonymy, of interest is the fact that the Tuyuk is as described only in terms of Arabo Persian prosody. In this regard, Turkologist reminds us of two things. First, the Ramali Musadari, Ramali Musadas Imaksur matches the 11 syllabic Turkic meter. Second, the Tajis is a poetic device that is perfectly suited to the structure of Turkic language. Thus, also the Tuyuk as a prototypically Turkic form was assuredly first composed in a syllabic meter of 11 syllables by Navoi's time and among those of his social class, it had been subsumed into the literary can canon under the rubric of the Ramal. Apparently then, Navoi's well-known well commitment to the emergence of Turkic as a valid literary medium did not extend, extend sorry, to the maintenance of two separate systems. Rather, the Turkic system was formulated in terms of the more prestigious literary medium that is Persian. In his treatise Aruz Risolase, Babur expands the treatment of the Turk genre further to include its classification into seven types both common and common, with example of each. But regardless of this virus edition, Babur admits Navoi's parameter of description. And Babur's world treatise is like that. He follows, even if he has new elements, he follows Navoi's type of proceeding. In conclusion, I would like to quote what Mehmet Köprül, Köprülü, the famous Turkish scholar, said about the two treatises in an article that was translated in French and published in a European volume dedicated to technology in the 1960s. Köprülü significantly stated that neither Navoy nor Babur succeeded in creating a specific Arab system for Turkey poetry. He is certainly right. But Nabawi and Babur never, want to do, never wanted to do that, for they did not share Kepler's chauvinist point of view. At a fundamental level, 
Navoe wanted to apply Perso-Arabic meters to the Turkic languages in order to raise the Turkic language to the rank of Persian. To do that, he had to persify the Turkic language he used just as much as he could. That is why, as at the beginning of Mizan al Azam, he made this distinction between Turkic language and Chagatai. He said, uh, I have written in the Turkic language, Turk Tele, and in every rule in which they showed ornament and embellishment to the maiden of the meaning, I turned to Chagatai phrases, Chagatai Lade, so that the aforementioned tongue will be the basis of language and expression that had not been used by any author and had not been applied for any scribe before. The phrase Chagatai Lafze refers to an elaborated, highly personalized language which is used to decorate Turkic language. Thus, the study of Mizan al Auzan helps, helps of solve what appears as the paradox for European commentators of Navoi. If Navoi was at the same time recognized to be the most important representative of Chagatai Turkey poetry and the major pacifier of Turkic language, it was because for him the low prestige of Turkic, especially as compared to Persian, made it necessary to pacify Turkic prosody and poetry. So, by revealing the complex interaction between Turkic and Persian languages, these treatises of prosody challenge the Eurocentric point of view, which, as shown by Kerpulus' statement, still fails to consider the importance of Turkic poets' subservience to Persian canons and models. Thank you very much. Great, and so we're actually ahead of, well, we're still behind, but um, not terribly. Uh, so, questions? Yes? Um, I uh, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciated it. And um, I would like to, uh, to ask you something since I have um, been engaged in Ilm al Arud with Tafailat, but from an, an Arabic perspective of inquiry, of course. So there are some f searches and references such as uh, Kiparski uh, and, uh, and uh, Bruno Paoli, which uh, who talk about uh, this um, linkages among Persian, Turkish, and uh, Arabic poetry. Um, but uh, I, I heard that um, um, Nawai, the, the editor of the tractis, said that he adapt, uh, adapted uh, the eight tafila of the Arabic tradition into five, uh, if I heard well, okay. And uh, actually, we have 10 tafailat uh, in the Arabic system. And uh, usually is an attempt of simplification uh, of some scholars when we say that there are only eight, because actually two, f four of them are written in two forms. So for example, we have Mustaf Elun, and we have also Mustafai Lun. So they are written by the same way, but actually are composed by different Majmuat uh, Sautiya, so groups of sounds. And this is relevant when uh, um, the Tafaila is invested by Ailal. Uh, I don't know in Turkish is the same term, Ailal. So a, low, and a, and a high impact uh, metrical variation or Zihaf. So a low impact metrical variation. My question is. Uh, um, he talked about uh, only eight tafaila because uh, he accepted this attempt for a, a simplification of the, the primary system, or because uh, the half and the elal occur in a different way into the into the Turkish system. Because I, I I don't really know, so I am really curious about about it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So um, now we talk about because Johnny, Michael, also. 
Yeah, you hear me? Okay. So now he talks about eight rooks of Safari Lat, as you wish, because uh, he modeled these treaties on Jamis treaties, who did that, you know. So he takes on the Persian legacy, which was, as it was, in the 15th century. No, it's not an innovation from Navarre. It takes on tradition. And about the Theophat, the Theophat are exactly the same in, uh, in Turkey, because you know in Turkey there is no, at least in the 15th century, there is no long, the difference between long and short label. So uh, you can scan a Turkish word either way. Okay, so that's why there is no such difference for the of the Olfat and the Ila. Yeah. Great. Any, any further further questions? Don't feel pressed. We we were, oh okay okay. We know that all uh, Arab books repeat each other. For example, in Arabic, Al Arud wal Kawafi wal Khatib Tabrizi, or Sahib bin Abbad, or passage from Al Ugd Al Farid Li bin Abd Rabbihi. Maybe in Turkish or um, Persian Arab books, the same is happening, maybe. But uh, I just wanted uh, to direct your attention to the work of Akram Jafar scholar, Soviet scholar, if you are looking for new insight into Aruz in Turkish languages, just read his book. I, unfortunately, the book in uh, Kyrillic alphabet in Azerbaijani, I can help you. But uh, really, it is a, do you know this book? Have he he's really was a great scholar in Aruz. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is not a question, just I wanted <laughs> to mention. Great. Are we ready to move to the next panel or uh, the next? Sorry, the next speaker. I think it would be good since we're still um, late. Um, so next, next speaker is um, Morat Umut Inan from the University of Ankara, who will be talking about Ottoman poetics, theories, and practices of poetry in the 16th century Ottoman world. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to begin by thanking uh, American University of Beirut and Hani Rashwan in particular for putting together this this fabulous um, conference and truly in an interdisciplinary setting. Um, so the title of my paper is Ottoman Poetics, uh, Theories and Practices in the, of Poetry in the 16th Century Ottoman World. I am fully aware of the fact that within a 20 minute presentation, it's really hard to, uh, to deal with this uh, topic, but uh, I'll, I'll just uh, share my preliminary findings and uh, will, uh, will be brief in my, um, in my argumentation. So, um, so first I would like to start uh, by saying that, well, I became interested in, in issues of uh, imitation, appropriation, translation, um, uh, mainly thanks to the Oriental Fathers of Literary Studies, uh, particularly thanks to Sir William Jones, uh, who repeatedly uh, described Ottoman literary culture as a, as, as, as a sort of uh, a Persianate literary culture. And then uh, we have a series of other scholars, um, the, uh, among whom uh, we have uh, Sir William, uh, Sir uh, Wilkinson Gibb, right, yeah probably give, yeah. Um, he is the first major Ottoman, uh, Ottomanist, actually, who uh, wrote um, a history of Ottoman poetry. It's a six volume book. And uh, when you flip through the pages of that history, it's all about how Ottomans, uh, quote, strove for centuries to write nothing, uh, little, nothing else than Persian poetry. It's all about uh, uh, Persian-centric treatment of, 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 the, of the Ottoman uh, poetic world. So, um, 
So nurtured by all these uh, Eurocentric and, and I'll say Persia-centric discourses, I uh, you know started looking at actually how Ottomans uh, studied poetry, uh, what, how they understood the processes of, of imitation and translation and appropriation, and what they thought about poetry. Uh, in a recent article, I looked at the issue of imitation within the Ottoman context, particularly uh, Suleiman the Magnificent's uh, appropriation of, of Hafiz poetry. Uh, and now I'm getting more into the question of um, how poetry was conceptualized and practiced within the Ottoman context, how they understood poetry and, and how they studied poetry. So, back to my paper. The 16th century not only marked the flourishing of Ottoman literary culture, where reading, um, studying, and writing poetry enjoyed prestige and popularity, but also witnessed an increase in theoretical and critical writings on poetry, uh, as well as in biographical works on poets. Uh, the Ottoman production, circulation, and consumption of poetry reached its apogee, uh, particularly under Sultan Suleiman I, better known as Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, according to Ashik Celebi, here we go, uh, an Ottoman poet, uh, biographer, and, and scholar, famous for his Teskira, biography of poets, entitled Meshair Shwara, Assemblies of Poets. Um, Ottoman poets acquired an unprecedented support from the royal court, uh, thanks to four particular characteristics of the reign of Suleiman. So here we have Suleiman, and uh, this is uh, his divan the autograph copy of his divan. Um, so, according to Ajit Chedevi, there are four particular reasons. First, the remarkable growth of imperial income resulting from military and geographical expansion. Second, the economic and political stability achieved by a long reigning sultan. Third, the unequal influx of scholars, artists, and poets from the Arab lands and Persia to Istanbul, the imperial capital. And finally, the sultan's passion for reading, studying, and writing poetry. Suleiman uh, was a bilingual poet. He composed poetry in Turkish as well as in Persian. And this is uh, the 16th century Ottoman world. It covers most of today's Middle East, as you see. Um, one particular poet and literary scholar who enjoyed Suleiman's patronage was Abdul Latif Latifi. <clears throat> in 1546, Latifi completed his Teskira to Shuara, which presents the biographies of 334 Ottoman poets. Latifi presented his Teskira to Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who welcomed his work and granted him a, a scribal position in Istanbul. Prefaced by a lengthy introduction on poetry and poets, Latifi's Teskira was one of the first major Ottoman texts devoted to the lives, works, and craftsmanship of Ottoman poets. One of the poets uh, Latifi included in his Teskira, Biography of Poets, was Fani, who, Latifi tells us, was not only a senior poet steeped in Arabic and Persian poetry, but also an acclaimed teacher who taught poetic forms and techniques to young and aspiring students of poetry. Latifi, too, studied poetry and Sufism with Fani and read under his guidance the texts of Fakhreddin Iraqi and Abdurrahman Jami. After presenting Fani's life and quoting some of his verses, Latifi deems it necessary to share with his readers some of the advice his teacher had offered his students. And I quote, this is what uh, Fani told Latifi. The art of poetry, uh, the original term is fenni shir, encompasses and is closely related to the following rhetorical arts. The art of poetic adornment, ilmi bedi, or the art of poetic beautification. The art of poetic expression, ilmi bayan. Number three, the art of rhyming, ilmi qawafi. And finally, the art of poetic meter, ilmi taqdi evza. Therefore, those who are new to the art of poetry should be knowledgeable in these arts so that they can develop an ability to read and write poetry. They should also study the divan's poetry collections of predecessor poets. Last but not least, they should not only have a good grasp of Arabic and Persian poetry, but should also store a good number of poetic words in memory so that their verses become well-structured and immaculate." End of quote. 
Another poet, um, whom uh, Latifi introduced in his, in his Teskira, was Khazri, was a poet named Khazri, the son of the famous Ahmed Pasha, who was a prominent <coughs> bureaucrat and court poet under Mehmed II, Mehmed the Conqueror. Latifi writes that Khazri was a very talented poet. He was able to write poetry both in Turkish and in Persian. In addition, his poems were semantically rich and blended together literal, mystical, <coughs> and metaphorical meanings, hakikat and majaz. What is particularly interesting about Latifi's portrayal of Khazri is that he highlights how a young and ambitious poet like Khazri studied and practiced poetry almost every day while modeling himself on the Persian master poet Hafiz of Shiraz. And I quote, Khazri spent most of his time studying the Divan of Hafiz, the poetry collection of Hafiz. And sometimes he also practiced writing Nazires, parallel poems imitating those of Hafiz, end of quote. Following these words, uh, Latifi quotes Khazri's translation of one of Hafiz's famous ghazals, lyric poem, into Ottoman Turkish. Latifi likes this <coughs> translation very much and suggests that Hazri's practice of translating Hafiz helped him develop his poetic skills. Now, the two quotations I have made from Latifi's Teskira refer to both theoretical and practical aspects of the art of poetry, while the first quotation, the one from Fani, stands as a recipe for good poetry from an Ottoman senior poet, the second one highlights how young Ottoman poets learned to craft poetry by studying, translating, and imitating the work of the master poets of Persia, like Hafiz of Shiraz. What is particularly significant about Fani's advice to Ottoman students of poetry is that he puts special emphasis on the close reading and analysis of Arabic and Persian poetry. Likewise, Fani's interpretation of poetry as a professional discipline is also eye-catching. He views poetry as an interdisciplinary art or science that subsumes various fields of study and requires a long-term commitment. Khazri's case, on the other hand, presents us with some key terms that relate to the ways in which poetry was studied and mastered by Ottoman poets, namely tetebbur, study and analysis of an individual poem, tarjama, translation, and nazira, imitation or modeling. I'll come back to these terms later in my paper. So, seen in this light, uh, this paper, this brief paper, is an attempt to explore and discuss, on the one hand, how Ottoman poets understood and approached poetry. Very simple question. And on the other hand, how poetry was studied and practiced in the Ottoman context, and particularly in the 16th century Ottoman context. To this end, first I'll focus on one of the early Ottoman texts on the art of poetry, namely the Bahrul Marif by Musleheddin Sururi. Here we have Sururi and his majlis, scattering of poets, and uh, his students, and this is uh, a sample folio from the Bahr al-Maharif. Bahr al-Maharif we can translate as ocean of sciences or knowledge. I'll briefly introduce and discuss Sururi's approach to and understanding of poetry. Then I'll revisit Latifi's and Asik Chalabi's Tezkiras, biographical works, to discuss some examples, some actual examples, that shed light on the processes and dynamics involved in Ottoman engagement with, with Persian poetry which remained a source of poetic learning and inspiration for generations of Ottoman poets. My argument here is that the rise of poetry, both as a prestigious profession and as a specialized discipline in the 16th century Ottoman world, can be better understood within the context of the making of Ottoman literary culture under the patronage of sultans, members of the court, and the imperial elite. In particular, the Ottoman Sultan's motivation in offering patronage to men of letters was to promote the formation and development of a refined literary culture that would blend together Arabic, Persian, and Turkish traditions in creative ways and as such would represent the grandeur of an empire fashioning itself as the new patron of the Islamic world. The Ottoman poets who received imperial patronage were therefore expected to be well versed not only in Turkish 
but also in Arabic and Persian languages and poetic traditions, and Ver encouraged to craft fine poetic works that would not only match, but also excel those produced by the Arabic and Persian masters of literature. Within such, such a sociocultural and political context, shaped by imperial ambitions to create a new literature and poetry in particular, the study of poetry gained momentum and became more institutionalized while poets achieved the higher ranks in Ottoman court and progress. So, uh, I'll start with Bahrun Maharif, as you see. which is, I think, one of the first major Ottoman texts on the art of poetry. Uh, a very interesting text. I, I'm planning to uh, do a critical edition and translation of the whole text. In 1548, Suleiman the Magnificent appointed Sururi, Musahiddin Sururi, to tutor his son Mustafa, the crown prince residing in the Anatolian city of Amasya. Since Mustafa was particularly interested in reading and writing poetry, Sururi instructed him in prosody, patterns of rhyme, and figures of speech, as well as in the classics of Arabic and Persian poetry. A year later, in 1549, upon Mustafa's request, Sururi compiled a companion to the art of poetry and entitled it Bahrul Ma'rif, Ocean of Knowledge, which obviously served as a textbook of poetry both for the crown prince and for those frequenting Sururi's poetry classes in Amasya. Sururi actually, in his work, uh, oh great, uh, Sururi actually has uh, has a special term for that, Tali uh, Mishir. He repeatedly uses this this phrase uh, to to make sure that you know uh, his readers know that he is a teacher of poetry. Tali um, Mishir. Okay. I should go fast. Bahr al-Marif consists of an introduction followed by three main chapters as well as a conclusion where Sururi reflects on the meaning and significance of poetry. The introduction focuses on key poetic terms and concepts before providing an overview of the art of prosody. Here Sururi also gives a definition of poetry and of poetic forms. As for poetry, he writes that, quote, lexically, the word shi'ir, poetry, means to know. As a term, however, it refers to a verbal expression that's, ve that's both well-balanced and meaningful, end of quote. To give another example, he defines the ghazal as follows. The word ghazal refers to a poem that consists of five, seven, or nine verses focusing on the theme of the beloved, implying that the ghazal is the name of both a poetic form and a poetic genre. In the first main chapter, Sururi introduces and illustrates patterns and techniques of prosody and rhyming through a variety of examples carefully selected from Arabic, Persian, and Turkish poetry. The second chapter is devoted to figures of speech. What is also noteworthy about this chapter is that Sururi largely draws on Rashid al-Din Watwat's famous work entitled Hadaiq al-Sihir fi Daqaiq al Professor Gold uh, talked about that in the morning, which is one of the early Persian Balagha texts. The third chapter is the longest chapter where Suri explains and illustrates the similes and metaphors commonly used in conjunction with the theme of the indifferent beloved and the desperate lover. And again, in this chapter, the reader is presented with plenty of sample verses from Arabic, Persian, and Turkish poetry. But perhaps the most interesting and significant part of the Bahrul Marif is surprisingly the conclusion, which uh, Suri calls Khatimah where Sururi shares his perception of poetry and elaborates on the benefits of reading poetry, referring to the Prophet Muhammad's words, which reads as, poetry contains some wisdom. Sururi especially focuses on how poetry transforms and empowers the intellectual and spiritual capacity of a human being. Here are some of his reflections on poetry. I'll just read my quotes. This is what Sururi says. Quote, one benefit of reading poetry is that it enriches your knowledge and deepens your understanding. Another benefit is that if you have a knowledge and understanding of poetry, then you can understand the miraculously intricate texture of the Holy Quran. Poetry stimulates your soul, fills your mind and heart with love and passion, and leads you towards the path of the true beloved, the divine. Reading and writing poetry helps you to refine your disposition and character and achieve a level of spiritual maturity. Then, Sururi raises the question of what is good or ideal poetry. 
he formulates the way he understands poetry as follows. And I quote, the art of poetry is achieved by creating meaning, ma'ana. A poem that lacks meaning is nothing but noise. Meaning, on the other hand, is nurtured by words. And those words lacking eloquence are like animal sounds. Um, finally, I should also point out that Latifi agrees with Suri's conception of poetry as an artistic com uh, composition that op operates on at least two semantic levels. In the preface to his Teskire, Latifi understands poetry as kalam zulvech hey, meaning a linguistically articulate expression that has two faces or aspects, majaz and hakika. Therefore, for both Sururi and Latifi, a good or successful poem is the one in which the ma'nai majaz, metaphorical or visible explicit meaning, uh, meaning that signifies a worldly setting, and ma'nai hakikat, the intended mystical hidden meaning, are intertwined together in the hands of a dexterous poet. Uh, I don't know how, know how many minutes. Uh, what are two? Okay, <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll just uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, just to give you an example of you know, the forms of studying and practicing of poetry, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, mention two examples and then, and then finish. Um, right. One particular poet, Latifi, discusses at great length is the above-mentioned Ahmed Pasha, the bureaucrat of, of Mehmed II and the father of history. Almost all of the literary scholars of the 16th century think that Ahmed Pasha owes his poetic success to his passionate and detailed study of the classics of Persian literature. Latifi is no exception. Commenting on the thematic and stylistic aspects of Ahmed Pasha's poetry, he writes as follows, and I quote, Ahmed Pasha extensively studied almost all of the divans compiled in the Persian language. He closely read almost all Persian poetry, paying special attention to figures of speech and tools of poetic ornamentation. Latifi also adds that Ahmed Pasha regularly practiced translating from Persian poetry to sharpen his poetic style and enrich his uh, repertoire of poetic vocabulary. Uh, so these are the major terms we see uh, regarding the forms of studying and practicing poetry. Uh, these are coming from Latifi's Teskira. Um, finally, I am about to finish. Right. Finally, when we turn to Ashik Celebi's Teskira, we further discovered that Ottoman poetic study focused on the work of seven Persian poets, whom Ottoman poets took as role models and viewed as master poets. Each poet was studied for different reasons. To illustrate this, Ashik Celebi refers to the words of an Ottoman poet named Yetim. According to Yetim, these seven Persian giant poets were first Jami, number two Nevai, number three Rumi, then Sadi, Nizami, Hafiz, and Khosrevi Dihlevi. Jami was studied for the intricacies of love. Nawai was studied for musicality and poetic rhythm. Rumi was studied to master the Mesnevi form. Sadi, how to pepper your poetry with wisdom and wise sayings. And Nizami for poetic unity and eloquence. Hafiz, the beauty of language. Khosrevi uh, Dihlevi, how to create an emotional tone that touches the heart of your readers. So, uh, so these were the major seven Persian poets, Ottoman. Uh, poets uh, focused uh, their attention. Um, and this is, um, finally, this is my, uh, one of my recent discoveries in Istanbul. Uh, this is a translation of, of Hafez poetry and it was used as a textbook in, in, in many Ottoman classrooms. As you can see here, uh, we have prosody going on and the translation. Um, this is a late 16th century uh, Ottoman translation of Hafez uh, poetry, and then other uh, uh, poets, young poets, studied the text. Uh, we can talk about that later. Thank you. Questions? Nothing at the moment. No questions? Uh, yes. I actually have a question for my fellow panelists that can also somehow reflect um, on at least the visual aspects of Mark's presentation as well because I was really intrigued as, I mean, it, it is totally predictable, I'm sure, that you subverted uh, E.J.W. Gibbs' um, 
paradigm of this paradoxical Ottoman poetic subject, right? He basically says uh, the only thing that Turks excel in mm -hmm. is imitation, right? You know, they, this is his uh, absolute judgment that he simply reiterates in six volumes. And, and they're not thin volumes, by the way. <laughs> but by really reconceiving this um, project of uh, imitation as a deep, profound uh, conversation and competition um, with Persian, especially, but also Arabic models of, of uh, poetic writing and, and patronage as part of a larger imperial project. I think you're really giving us an interesting um, and, you know, to my knowledge, again, a very original reading. Uh, of the theories and practices of, of poetry in the 16th century. Now, I was wondering if you could elaborate how that um, unfolds in relation to this proliferation of readers and reading material with which you open, right? Your first uh, scene in this presentation was uh, precisely that, that it was in, in the 16th century uh, there was a certain uh, proliferation of writing right. and reading yeah. poetry. How and would you, right, how, how would you describe that, that difference, right? What made the 16th century practice of reading and writing poetry different from what came before? And do you see any parallels, again, me being uh, much more ignorant of the 16th century, still knowing something, uh, do, would you see any parallels between the developments in the 16th century mm -hmm. and the developments in the 19th century in terms of this uh, expansion of readers mm -hmm. and reading material? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. I, um well, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the paper, uh, there are some reasons uh, why uh, why uh, poetry gained such popularity and circulation and prestige, particularly in the 16th century, and particularly during the time of Suleiman. Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, Lamic, uh, Ashik Celebi lists four, four major reasons, and I, I totally agree. I mean, he, and, and when he lists those reasons, he refers to some uh, sociopolitical and, and historical events and, and institutions. And, and, and justifies each reason. Um, uh, I don't want to say that, well, 16th century, you know, was the golden era of, of, of poetry and uh, it was incomparable to any preceding or following era. Uh, that would be a great mistake. I mean, uh, this imperial project of, of making a, a new literary culture goes back to Murat II, actually. Uh, you know, Suleiman's great great grandfather, uh, Murat II, and then we have Mehmed II. Particularly during the time of Mehmed II, after the fall of Constantinople, one of his main concerns was to create a court and court culture, uh, plus a new language, an imperial language, and, and, and literary culture. Uh, so these projects go back to, uh, noticeably go back to the time of Mehmed II. Um, but what we see during the time of Selim I and then his son Suleiman, we have um, we have now the empire is getting closer to the Arab lands and Persia thanks to all these uh, military campaigns and 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 that also you know uh, brings together an influx of scholars and texts and ideas and methodologies and philologies from the Arab lands, particularly from Baghdad and from Persia, meaning. Uh, some parts of Central Asia and Tabriz in particular. So the Ottomans get, get closer. Uh, you know, the, the, the encounters with, with, with Persians and, and, and the Arabs and, and all these poetry, suddenly we have Istanbul is, is filled with Persian and Arabic poetry. Ahdi of Baghdad, for example, when it comes to the 16th century Ottoman capital, Istanbul, during the time of Suleiman, he, he, he feels like perplexed and confounded. He says, well, in every corner of the city, people are reading Arabic and Persian poetry. What's going on here? 
So, so we have this proliferation of, of poetic study and, and you know, uh, poetic culture. Um, and, I, and I see that within this context of imperial uh, identity making and imperial making of, 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 a new, of, of lit literature uh, sponsored by the sultans, not only by the sultans and members of the elite. Um, as, as for your, you know, the, the, the Gib problem or the, the, the question of, you know, the Gib's portrayal of, of, of the Ottoman world as a Persia-centric world, uh, I think it's problematic mainly because of the fact that Gib uh, conceptualizes imitation completely as a negative, uh, completely as a negative phenomenon. I mean, he, he, he's very clear on that. Either you are a creator, a mubdir, or a, an imitator, muqallid. But actually, when we look at the workings of Ottoman poetry, taklit and imitation and nazira and all, and all these forms of poetic study and elaboration are actually seen as creative processes. Uh, there was one quotation, but I didn't have time for that. Latifi makes a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, case in his introduction. He divides the poets into two groups, uh, Mubdir and Muqallid, but he says, well, when it comes to the second category, uh, a poet can be Muqallid, but if he studies, if he passionately studies the divans and, and the language and all that, he becomes a truly Mubdir, a creative poet. So, um, so this is why I think, yeah, Gib, Gib gives us a lot of you know, material and insights, but at the same time, uh, there is a lot, you know, within the workings of the Ottoman canon that would, um, that, that would, you know, uh, challenge his perception of, of, of the Ottoman world. Yeah. Great. Um, I can, I, there's a one sentence I wanted to say, and then you know, any immediate questions, though? Great. Okay, so I just one comment. Maybe I don't want to go off any tangents because we're still over time. But just uh, comparing your two presentations, I was um, there seems to be a, a sort of different narrative around um, imitation and the the, the the presence of Persian. It seems to be more negative in the Central Asian case. Maybe that could be influenced by my knowledge of Navai's writings. But in, but I, I, I'm over time anyway. So maybe I'll just leave that thought there. Um, if there we could think about whether there's a difference between Ottoman and Chagatai. Uh, great. So our next speaker. Is um, is it possible to set the laptop up there to maybe use the pointer? Uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm Where not not knowledgeable about how to do that. I can just unplug this and plug it up. Huh? <clears throat> so uh, should I? I'll introduce you while, while that's going on. Uh, great. So the next speaker is uh, Suyung Kim from Koch University, who will be speaking about towards a poetics of continuity. And translatability, the case of Ankaravi Miftahul Balaka. Thank you, Rebecca. So, uh, while we uh, wait to have this set up, and I'm, I'm going to abbreviate my uh, presentation a little bit because uh, all the speakers on the panel so far has touched upon things I will also touch upon. In many ways, uh, my presentation is a sequel to uh, what Murad just spoke. It will also deal with uh, some of the things that was discussed before lunch about translatability, but within a broader Islamic context. What do Turks and Persians do with uh, Belagod texts? Manuals, technical manu manuals, as we all know, are difficult to translate. If you ever had to use a manual to use any kind of electronic item, and it, you actually compare the translations, they don't actually quite work at times. Um, OK, great. Can we just start this? Yeah, what are you doing? So while we're setting up still, I'd like to uh, thank Hanny for organizing this and also Rania for dealing with the logistics and also for Rebecca for uh, an email a long time ago <laughs> about a proper Ottoman Belagat text. And I said I had no idea that I uh, rediscovered this a part of, and I'll explain part of a new project I have. So, thank you. Uh, okay. So, so I don't really work on rhetoric specifically. I just recently published a book on canon formation, particularly poetic canon formation, Ottoman in the 16th century. 
Uh, and I'm working on a new project on canonicity and novelty in the 17th century, particularly dealing with issues of multilingualism, expanding literary public and collecting practices to actually um, answer briefly Feli's question about uh, the rise of anthologies, multilingual anthologies, which is a particularly 17th century phenomenon in the Ottoman context, to get a better sense of personal reading collect practices and um, the reiteration of canon in the poetic sphere. And, and also, um, so I just to part of my general project. So I start, and I will also show this images from an early 1330s copy of the Mitafu Belaga by Kazwini. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about Kazwini's Mitafu Belaga, like my Ottoman guy doesn't really talk about him. This is kind of misleading. So you can take a look at it. Um, but this was also produced in Eastern Anatolia or Western Ajam of the period. So there's a lot of interest in this particular text. So I begin, and I'll do it very quickly, and I'll elide some stuff. Um, in an assessment of recent generations of Ottoman poets composing in Turkish, although they wrote composed in Arabic and Persian as well, the historian and critic Mustafa Ali died in 600, 1600, but circa 1599, says the following about one older poet, a poet I've worked on, Zati, who died in 1546. Quote, if out of ignorance Zati is praised, then good judgment and good sense are absent. If praise on the ba basis of scholarly status, uh, of learning in Arabic studies, ilm al-Arabiya, or of knowledge of Persian art, fenifus, it is quite the opposite. The unfavorable verdict on Zati, a popular poet who died over half a century ago, is telling on two fronts, suggested in the <clears throat> suggested in the verdict is Mustafa Ali's conviction that to produce Turkish poetry of the highest order first required a command of Arabic compositional and semantic rules, particularly Me'ani and Bayan, then of Persian stylistic or Bediya or the art of figurative embellishment. In his general assessment, no particular course of study for an inspiring poet is prescribed, but perhaps there was no need to, Mustafa Ali, himself was an able poet and a graduate of the medrasa, where, the, where obviously the study of <coughs> Arabic linguistics was a fundamental part of the curriculum. Moreover, he was not alone in, in according priority to that sort of training. Mustafa Ali belonged to a group of men, all graduates of the medrasa, who dominated literati circles at the time. Thus also suggested in the verdict on Zati is the view that poetry was regarded as a marker of education, and especially public one at that given its performative nature. As is often pointed out, poetics in the Islamic tradition fell within the purview of rhetoric. As Julie Maysami further notes, quote, poetry and the poetic use of language was the standard to which oratory was likened and artistic prose assimilated, end quote the opposite of the classic Aristotelian formulation which privileged prose speech. Nevertheless, to, the study of rhetoric was an essential component of to Arabic linguistic training at the medrasa, and I'm talking specifically Ottoman medrasas in Istanbul capital. Uh, and the primary teaching manual at the Ottoman school was El Kasvini's classic early 14th century Telhis, as you know, a digest of El Sakiki's Mifta Olun, and a work synonymous with rhetoric or Belaga, at least in the Ottoman context. One of the preparatory schools, a medrasa says in the Ottoman context, was named the Mifta Medras Liri. Um, and of those ostensibly about psycho teaching Sakaki's Mifta, it was really uh, the Telhis of Kazvini's that was taught. <coughs> and of course, taught beside it were subsequent abridgments and commentaries. Now, in 1982, Christopher Ferrar, who's no longer in the field, remarked that the use of, that their use, particularly commentaries and super commentary, points to the difficulty that Turkish speakers, Turkish speaking students, had in comprehending the Telhis. Notably, as an aide, um, Alta Parmak Mehmet Effendi, a former medrasa instructor, produced a Turkish language commentary slash translation, a terjama sometime in the late 16th century that Mustafa Ali was writing. This work, however, gained little currency. 
and it probably only began to circulate after the author's death in 1624. There are only two surviving copies of it in the Stambul libraries, and it wasn't very popular. As the example, the bibliographer Katib Chilabi, as you Arabists know better as Haji Khalifa, makes no mention of it in his bibliograph 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 bibliographical dictionary, Keshf of 1652. The works, <coughs> no one talks about the work, and even having looked at it briefly, it's a terrible translation, it's not really a commentary, and it points to the difficulty of translating technical manuals. If students learning rhetoric had no readily available Turkish resource prior to the 17th century, they had recourse to a 15th century Persian work by Mahmoud Gavan, his Menazir in Shah, originally produced in the Deccan in India, um, <coughs> before continuing and also as sort of a, a comment to um, Rod's um, presentation, I should mention that by available Turkish resource, I mean works that specifically deal with rhetoric, as exemplified by the Telkis, uh, thereby excluding manuals concentrating on the technicalities of versification, like Sururi's Bahram Ma'arif um, of 1549, and it's described that way by Katib Chelebi. Um, to return to the Manazir, as the title indicates it, of the work on epistolography, nevertheless, it's important for us as a work and rhetoric lies uh, in its accessible presentation of the subject, with examples and, exa examples and explanations taken from the Telkis, mainly on Bayan, with no separate sections devoted to Me'ani or Bedia. And in fact, the Ottomans really didn't care about Me'ani, and I'll get to that point. <coughs> To this is added a makana or chapter on different sections, different forms of poetic composition and verse composition, followed by another on prose style. The Manazar achieved a level of popularity among Ottoman literati to the extent that the biographer and scholar Tashkur in his Mital Saada of 1558, a bibli bibliographical work, gives notice to it. More significantly, the Manazar would serve as the basis for what we may deem the first proper uh, Turkish manual on rhetoric, Ankaravi's early 17th century Miftao Belaga, and the focus of the remainder of my paper. Now, the Miftao of Ankaravi, who died in 1631, who supposedly conversed poetry, composed poetry in all three languages, was likely produced sometime after 1610, when he became the sheikh of the Mevlevi Hane in Galata in Istanbul, um, so if Bilal's here, Rumi makes his appearance once again. <laughs> After spending seven years in Cairo or Musser studying various sciences, exoteric, esoteric, but the biographical uh, sources tell us with whom and what we don't know. Uh, Ankaravi was r a rather prolific writer producing 33 works that we can safely attribute to him, chiefly on Sufism and in Turkish, and best known for his commentary on Rumi's Mesnavi. He also compiled the Divan of Poems, where we don't have a full copy, except there is a partial copy in the Vatican of all places. Um, and that said, he was held in high regard by his educated peers. For example, Chate Celebi, a junior contemporary, states that his knowledge of most of the sciences was unrivaled. <coughs> Regarding the Mufte, an account of how it came to be written down is given at the beginning. Ankaravi relates that two of, and two of his students, who happened to be descendants of Rumi, had trouble understanding the Telkis, and he produced a work to assist them. And I'll give you the translation. However, uh, this is from an 18th century copy. I couldn't locate a contemporary copy. There are about 14 um, copies available, and two, three are in Topkapa. And it's actually kind of a pain to ask to look at on short notice. So, how does this work? Okay. Oh. So it starts from sort of here and ends at the top. So, um, and I should have done a better job like Mark and cropped it a little bit, but this is uh, on short notice the best I could do. So I'll quote this is a translation. So they had been. They had been eager to learn the craft of poetry and know-how in prose, the science of rhetoric and the art of eloquence, and began to study under the poor, this poor Mehlevi, I, Sheikh Ismail Ankaravi, the Telkhis, the most cryptic of the Damascene preacher's works. Not mature enough, they had difficulty getting their minds around the subtle points in that book of rhetoric and became fed up with that science. 
pity and compassion boiled up inside this humble servant, and to facilitate for them and others' interest in rhetoric and eloquence, I abridged that foundational book and cited the most indispensable verses and words for learning the arts of figurative language, speech and embellishment, excuse me, and explicated them in Turkish. Here and there, as a doorman, I quoted Persian and Arabic verses belonging to poets and the most eloquent of men. This work is therefore an introduction to appreciating poetic forms and prose style. There are four chapters all together, and each has numerous sections. Its name is Key to Rhetoric, and the Lamp of Eloquence. May this jewel that shines by night the, the rare gift be a blessing, the key to the key and the lamp upon the books concerning the art of rhetoric. Now, the Mifta, as Ankhrabi notes, is divided into four chapters. The first two chapters deal with Bayan, the third with poetic forms and Badia, and the last with prose style. The chapters and content should sound familiar. The Manaz here is structured in similar fashion, and Ankhrabi clearly made use of the earlier work, even if there's no explicit mention of it in his account of the motive for writing down his own work. Nevertheless, Ankhrabi does provide prose examples of Mahmoud Gavan's several of Imam Gavan several times, and does so perhaps playful, playfully in the section on iktibas, or qu quotation. Uh, and speaking of the Mifta, Farrar has described it as, quote, virtually a direct translation, end quote, a character, character characterization reflecting the opinion of the editor of the print edition of 1867, who we think is Namik Kemal before he ended up in London. And of course, Namik Kemal was very much into um, works on rhetoric in the local languages. In the preface to it, the Menazer is identified as the quote, source of origin, or the Me'az, or to pronounce it more Arabic, Me'az. <coughs> but a closer and preliminary examination, one of the older manuscript copies of the Mifta, this one from the 18th century, suggests that while the work is indeed dependent on the Menazer, it would be mistaken to view it merely as a translation, as Farrar does. To illustrate this, I have chosen several parallel and brief passages from the Manazar and Miftar, Miftar for comparison, but I'll condense it to two for time's sake. The copy of the Manazar dates from, and this is um, copy of the, this is a copy of the Manazar, it's one of the earliest examples we have, dates from 1573, and the copy of the Miftar likely from the latter half of the 18th century. <coughs> and the initial set of so um, the first, the initial set of passages concerned the explanations or their explanations of kalam vis-a-vis -vis istila. I will just, I was going to read out the Persian, the Turkish, Lash, and English as three acts of translation and transaction. But for, for uh, time's sake, I'll just quickly uh, point out so you can follow it while I read the English translation. So, so I'll just read the beginning always as the, um, if you, and it always starts from classical as Annie and goes to uh, different methods. Bihi, Bihi, Sani, Bihi, Bukmi, Mahlan, Mahlan, Kana, Al, Mustamalan, Yan, and the Persian comes. So that's the typical formula of the work. So it gives a phrase, and these are the phrases from the Telkis. And uh, so more or less goes like this. And I can read out the Persian, but the, you can ask later, but I'm going to quickly go through this. The Turkish is similar. <coughs> and so we're talking earlier about translatability. We might think about yani as this very important term for explaining things. So, um, so it starts here, as I quote again, men at the left is, at the left is, and here you can stemakla, yang in Turkish, right? So similar ways. <coughs> so, and, and basically, um, the translation I gave was, in, I'll give you the English based on the Ankaravi version, is technically described it by saying, quote, me yatalefes bihi al san al fi hukmi mufmelan kana al mustamelan, that is, stemaki yani, utterance is a thing that people utter or does think they utter in its statement, more generally, is either what's in use or not, uh, something that Veli talked about. The value of the phrase is that includes what's inferred pronouns, that since what's inferred is uttered in a statement. 
Ankrabi's descriptions in near verbatim translation or adaptation of Gaz Gavan's, albeit uh, in more simpler and clearer terms if you're a Turkish speaker, although the, if you're a Turkish speaker, you would understand the Persian as well. In fact, Ankrabi does this as a rule throughout the first two chapters dealing with Bayan. And I have another example um, <coughs> uh, dealing with Tariz, which sort of ends this section on Bayan. Um, it's more of an approximation and direct translation, so it really depends on what he's describing or explaining on the part by Ankaravi. If there's a particular Turkish idiomatic phrase, he'll use it. Um, we'll move on. So, <coughs> so I will say this very. Um, in the ch so in his chapters on poetic forms and Bedi Ankaravi is likewise dependent on Mahmoud Gavan. Uh, for instance, Gavan quotes in full as an example are not surprisingly a gazelle of Hafez. The poem stops, um, is Bisheno in Nuktaki, Khodra Zagam Azade Kuni, Khon Khori Ger, Taleb Ruzia, No Nihade Kuni. Um, and he cites it, but he also gives his own Turkish poetic examples, and they're not translations. In fact, they're to accentuate. Um, but he doesn't do that for every poem, and he also mentions that for particular examples, like the gazelle, he doesn't give uh, Arabic equivalents because the gazelle is a form, it's a particularly Persianetic form. Moving on, I'll <coughs> to conclude. Uh, that said, by, by this chapter and what follows, Ankrevi's purpose in writing the Mifta becomes clearer. Unlike other chapters, the final one, while still relying on the Manazir, does not concern prose style. Rather, it combines material on Insha from the first and last chapters of the Manazir in quite an abridged manner. Here, and so basically, Ankrevi drops out all the part on prose, more or less, at the end. Uh, and what's the distinguishing part about Gavan's work is that the whole part about Sedge in particular is dropped out. So, he bas um, so what he does is, um, what I'm suggesting is, Ankrabi's aim was not just to reproduce the Gavan's work in Turkish as Farrar would have, but rather I suggest the Miftah should be seen as a Javap or Jawab, or response to the Manazir in which poetry is no longer subsidiary to prose, which Ankaravi literally addresses at the end as the rhetorical enterprise, but as the, the raison d'etre for rhetorical enterprise. Um, and hence Ankaravi Anka reinserts the inextricable link between poetry and rhetoric. Now I have a couple of, to address um, a number, couple of things, I'm going to say this very quickly, and I'll, um, so why, why does a work like Ankara become in the early 16th, early 17th century? Um, so Murat talked about biographical writers, and there's a particular, the last of the biograph classical biographical writers, Riazi, who produced his Teskid in 1609. Represent, this is how he describes Turkish as a literary language, and I'll just give you quickly a translation to quote, uh, because the words elfaz are inadequate and improper, rekikul nahenvar, that Turkish is, it's difficult to write poetry in Turkish. Um, <coughs> in other words, while Ottoman poets did had no anxiety of influence, they certainly had an anxiety of language that persisted at, t at the turn of the beginning of the 17th century after a canon had been formed as um, Murad sort of discussed with all these sort of pedagogical tools. So, and Riazi goes further, he cites this famous line by Jami that goes, Aslamani, manist, mani, tavani, der ibaret, chu futa nuksani, the English translations, when there's, a, there's meaning in the root, deficiency in expression isn't a sin. I sort of like, okay, Turkish, yeah, has had problems, but it's okay to, for us to write. Uh, <coughs> But what's interesting about Riazi's the introduction is that all the poetic vote verses he cites are all Persian and they're more or less contemporary. So as Murat said, in the period of 16th century, we had the idea of canon. In fact, one of the poets he cites, and he doesn't mention who they are, so you have to really track these um, verses down. It's one by Zuhuri of Tushis, who's a poet from the Deccan, who's best known for his Sakhiname uh, from the end of the, 15th, end of the 16th century. Now, <laughs> I find it curious that <laughs> A, the Ottomans were interesting things coming out of India, but of course Mahmoud Gavan was still heavily read in Mughal India. So what does this suggest? It suggests that Persian um, poets, were, the Ottoman poets were still interested in Persian as competition, and particularly coming out of Mughal India, it's interesting that, and also something that, um, uh, that was mentioned earlier that there's a 17th century 
work on rhetoric translation of Persian coming out of Mughal India, that in fact, um, while the Ottomans were interested in Ilma Arabiya, ultimately they were still focused on Tana Furs. And this work, the, the Ankarabi's work, is kind of a misleading work, but ultimately there's a renewed interest in language. And um, that and the implications of that I'm still thinking through how might relate to Sabke Hindi or Taze Gui, as uh, Ferenc talked about. But, um, but it's only at this time, as far as I know, that there's an attempt to produce a proper work in rhetoric in a local language that would have a wider audience. Um, and one that actually makes sense. And one that, that and for people who are Persian and Arab, this is not about accurately translating these points. So we talked about earlier in part of the discussion, it's uh, something that Alexander brought up. It's not, they never try to translate the technical terms. They're only focused on explaining yani, what's explainable and what's actually accessible to, um, to their local audience. And one that's not, at least in the Ottoman context, outside the madrasa. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Questions from the floor? No. The, 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 everything seems to sort of link together increasingly, so I have a feeling questions will come up uh, yes. in response to later presentations. Should we move on to the, because we are actually still significantly over time, so it might, uh, I have thoughts too, but maybe, yeah, 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 yeah towards yeah. the end, great. Okay, so I'm introducing now our final speaker, um, Aida Gasimova from Baku State University, who will be speaking about many faces of the Quran depict in depiction of the face, Harufi poetics of Nisimi. My presentation is a part of my project entitled Quranic Symbolism in Depiction of Facial Features in Azari. What? This is the... the, the this is, yes, this okay. is part of my book. Okay. Yes, all these eyes, uh, eyebrows. <laughs> yes, this is right. Uh, Quranic Symbolism in Depiction of Facial Features in Azari Turkic Sufi Poetry. In my previous articles on this subject, I argue that Quranic symbols uh, in Azeri Turkic Sufi poetry, first of all, depend on the natural mode, function, and dynamics of shape and motion of a depicted feature. This natural shape, uh, the natural shape of the features of the face, served as a main criterion in Sufi philosophical interpretation of Quranic images, according to the following factors. First, number: the singular nature of mole, dual nature of the coupled eyebrows, innumerability of the curl, as you see first picture, uh, which is made of many individual hairs, produce relevant images. Shape and appearance. The general appearance and configuration of facial features also broadens the horizons of poetic imagination. For instance, symbols relating to the eyebrows, my second and third pictures, uh, photos, include the elements of a circle. Therefore, semicircular arched brows called for such a mythology as a bow, Gaba Gaussian, the half moon, Shakul Gamar, the letters known and Gav, etc. Color. This factor is one of the most important aspects in terms of the use of Quranic images in classical Azari Turkish Sufi poetry. Redness of the cheek indicates God's manifestation. Blackness of the curl are associated with special Quranic motifs. Motion. The more dynamic a feature is, the more intensive and meaningful are its images. From this point of view, the curl, lips, and eyes, with its uh, uh, dynamics of shape, motion, and aroma, produce a great number of poetic images and esoteric meanings. Associated elements. 
There are a number of elements associated with facial features such as tears, five and six photos, uh, the breath, breath nine, uh, the aroma of the hair, the luster of the eye, luster of the eye I had uh, 12. Yes, uh, the luster of the eye, which are also illustrated alongside the features of the face, giving these images more flexibility and embellishment. Uh, the present work is devoted to the depiction of the face as a whole, not its parts, and it is a following chapter of my project after studies devoted uh, to the images related to eyebrows, eyes, and curl. The object of the paper is the poetry of Imad din Nasimi. Imad din Nasimi is one of the prominent figures of medieval Turkish literature. You saw him. Uh, this is from movie Nasimi 8, number 8. This is uh, Rasim Balayev starring. Um, all, uh, prominent figures of medieval Turkish literature. Although his poetry testifies the variability of his philosophical thoughts, his name associated with Hurufi teaching. The poet was a follower of Hazullah Astarabadi and a passionate agitator of Hurufism. Nasimi was a martyr who suffered painful days by skin and alive uh, that raised him in the eyes of many to a level uh, what happened? Uh -huh. to, to a level um, uh, near that of sainthood. It seems he was one of the important sheikhs of that heretic sect, and his poetry and personality was so prominent that, as status Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, even the movement itself sometimes was known as Nasimiyya. Nasimi's first place was either Tabriz, as Arab sources noted, or Transcaucasia, as uh, claims Salman Mumtaz. The poet lived in a period of the hegemony of Turkish dynasties and suffered from the orthodox inquisitional policy of Egyptian Mamluks, who established their authority over Syria in the poet's lifetime. Nasimi was executed in 1917 by the fatwa of scholastic theologians, as explains Burrell, not only Hurufi affiliation, as well as some heterodox adherents like uh, I am uh, the Turus and al Haq, stimulated his execution. No doubt political considerations also played a part in the action against him. Nasimi was a poet philosopher whose poetry prevailed over the philosophy. He has had a huge impact on the, on the Turkish literature's intense emotion of his passionate poems gained public favor. These poems were sing, uh, sung in Sufi uh, gatherings promulgated by everyone who just loved good poetry. The focus of the study is the usage of Quranic motifs in depiction of the face in Nasimi's poetry. The face is the most important aspect of speculations in Hurufi thought and uh, the mainstream of Nasimi's poetic outflows. Although I am interested pri primarily in depiction of the face in general, checks for it and it is. Uh, as it is part for full understanding the subject, I start with a few words about importance of human body in Sufi Hurufi teachings. Nasimi's nickname pointed to the spiritual significance of human being. Nasim means breeze, gentle wind, alluding to the Holy Spirit. However, the poet was a passionate painter of human body. Diverse of Nassim's mystic philosophical views, uh, views are seen in his thought on the soul and body. In some poems, maybe under the influence of Neoplatonism, the poet considers the body a prison for the soul. O oh, sacred nightingale, what a suffering in the cage. Do break it and fly to the fresh blossom of paradise. 
Ey bülbül güçsi, ne giriftarı kafessen, sındır kafesi taze gülistan talep eyle. In spite of such speculations, the importance and even centrality of physical body stands out in his poetry. As a Hurufi poet, he adored human being not only for the immortal soul endowed by God, but also due to his body, manifestation of God and divine scripture. One can suggest influence of Christianity that represented in the in the personality of Jesus as a significant example of human flesh in its divine embodiment. In Sufi poetry among bodily parts, the face has always been a main object of philosophical speculations and artistic depictions. In Hurufism, uh, the face exemplified motherly knowledge by reflecting uh, through the seven maternal lines, lines of the primordial mother Eve of the hair in the human face. A Quranic text which runs, Kullu men aleyhe fanin ve yabka vachu rabbika zul jalali wal ikrami, referring of course to the face of God, has been denoted by Nasime and the other Hurufis as referring to the human face to which, as we have seen, they attributed extraordinary significance. Uh, according to Hurufis, the human face itself was a holy writing mentioned in the Quran, uh, in the phrase, وَكِتَابٍ مَسْتُورٍ فِي رَقٍ مَنْشُورٍ by a book scribed in a parchment uh, unfolded. In accordance, Nassim says, seven ayats have been written by the immaculate hand of God. Seven lines were drawn on the parchment and rolled. Skin, by, uh, skin is a highly anthropomorphized image in the Quran. As we see, it is a deified element in Hurufi heretic interpretation. Obviously, man, book, universe conception of Hurufis is seen in the architectonics of Arabic language and indicates it is antiquity in the minds. For instance, Basharat, skin, Bashar, man. Adam, first man, first man Adim, uh, skin. Both Adim and Sahib have such a definition as the upper layer of earth from the soil of which the first man, Adam, has been created. Apparently depicted above metamorphosis like human Quran, human scripture, derived from Hurufi mystic philosophical thought. The Kabbalah, which is one of the prerequisites of Hurufi teaching, depicted the process of writing as an anthropomorphic ac action. The pen is represented like phallus. The ink dropped from the edge of pen was likened to sperm, while the paper to the woman's womb. In Fadullah's teaching, two aspects of human scripture are observed. The first is metamorphosis of human being into divine scripture and the second metamorphosis of book into human being. Such a metamorphosis is seen in the Quran, in the phrase, وَلَدَيْنَ كِتَابٌ يَنْتِقُوا بِالْحَقِّ and in كُلُّ شَيْءٍ أَخْزَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ in the meaning a clear book. All these points have been evaluated in Nassim's poetry. In the line below, the poet claims that the Quran speaks via his tongue, but he unites the image of the lover himself and the beloved, Fadlullah, expressing the idea of union with the universal perfect man. Nasimi and Fadl is a speaking Quran today. The mystery of Yazdan, the light of Subhan, and the word of the uh, Quran have been revealed. These obscure arguments were evolved into a presentation of canonical symbolic patterns in the poetry to such a degree that the highly embellished style subsequently overwhelms the metaphysical Hurufi speculations. So if the Hurufism was a relevantly small heterodox organization and its adherents were ignorant unbeliever according to Kulpinarlı, uh, and the tenet itself fanciful, absurd, and incomprehensible for Europeans, according to Brown, 
turned out to be a fantastically luxurious source of motifs and images for the poetry. And here a question arises. To what extent uh, these heterodox notions affected the cruelty of Nassim's execution? Why has the poet been flayed alive? You see 13th uh, photo. Flayed alive. One can suggest that importance attached to human skin as a parchment where God's word is manifested might evoke in executioner's mind such a terrible way of execution. Another hypothesis can be execution styles tracing back to old Assyrian tradition. Let us remember also Barcelome, the apostle from Michelangelo's The Last Judgment. We don't have it here. Yeah. Ah, 14. Uh, on the other hand, as noted above, according to the Quran, the skin has a special significance. In the hereafter, human skin will testify against guilty men. They will ask their skin, why did you testify against us? Unfortunately, medieval biographers of the poet didn't explain this side of his, of his martyrdom, but depicted colorful picture of the process itself, which portrayed Nesime as a hero who didn't lose his dignity even in facing death. The echoes of Nesime's execution affected the following events. Haji Sorg in Isfahan, who led the Hurufi rebellion against Timurid governor, was captured and fled alive in 1431. The practice was used in Ottoman period against rebels and those executed for political reasons for prolonging their suffering and agony. Nassim's metaphorical language is not only a rhetorical device, but also an important part of his philosophical thought. Although metaphor in philosophy may be distinguished from the metaphor in poetry by being primarily an explanatory rather than an aesthetic device, uh, in Nassim's case, metaphorical language serves for both artistic and philosophical purposes. The main source of metaphors in the Quran with each its names, attributes, um, uh, surahs, ayats, narrative passages, personages, and attached letters. There is a very interesting structural correspondence between the face and it is Quranic images which we can name whole for whole, part for part structure. Parts of the face borrow parts of the Quran. Surahs, ayats, words, narrative, pas uh, narrative passages, and attached letters, pa persons, personages, for expressiveness, for depiction. Therefore, while the phase, in most cases, is compared to, to the Quran as a whole, its parts enjoy excessive chain of uh, metaphors. In lack of theory of metaphor, metaphors involve understanding one domain of substance in terms of a very different domain of mm -hmm, uh, substance. In Hurufi poetry, metaphor has some different definition. Here, lack of target domain and source domain are not represented in the different sides of existence, but they are hierarchies and strata of the oneness demonstrating the union of beings. In whole for whole structure, at first sight, the depiction of the face using the Quran itself for depiction of the face may not seem such colorful like the component for component images. Berthius directs attention to the richness of the metaphors of the curl, relating it to the curls being Sufi symbol of Kasrat, while the face being the symbol of absolute, oneness of God which doesn't offer much room for poetic speculations uh, because transcendent is uh, undepictable uh, but imminence is imaginable. The Quran emphasizes this contrast by saying uh, Nevertheless, when the conceptual use of metaphor offers only one Quranic image for the face, image of the book as as whole, it is attributes and names like Mushaf, 
Furkan, Lauf Mahfuz, and other names and uh, come to the scene for artistic embellishment and philosophical uh, expressiveness. Uh, the Guran itself, as a metaphor of faith, maintains its primary, primary function. Throughout Nasimi's poetry, the Guran's connection with the process of recitation, giraya, memorizing, hips, completing hatim, and commenting shar has been emphasized and transferred to the uh, faith. Excuse me. While the Quran is a divine word, Kalam, revealed through the divine revelation, where, and Law Mahfuz is an archetypical meta book, Mushaf is a physical object, a volume which Muslims use in their everyday life. Therefore, the images, oh, okay, uh, uh, images related uh, uh, to the Mushaf are usually connected to calligraphy, book binding, writing styles, calligraphy, and the book's usage by Muslims everyday, everyday life. In comparison with the Quran, we can assume that the Quran, being God's word, is more abstract and coincides with the first intellect, spirit, and logos, while Mushaf is a concrete volume of the book, therefore it is uh, more material than spiritual. Hence, Fizuli didn't compare the face of beauty to Mushaf, uh, and I am finishing by the uh, line of Fizuli, uh, it would be a mistake to call the page of beauty Mushaf. It is a book full of words of the, for the gnosis of God's grace. Mushaf demek hatadır ol sefheyi cemala. Bu bir kitap sözdür fehmeden ehli hala. Thank you. Questions? We have about five minutes, four minutes, less than that, three minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, have, um, I have one question for Ida and one question for Su Young. Um, the, the question for Su Young is: What what has your research made you think about the way that these three, at least, languages existed in the minds of the? the scholars who are using them all. Like you can, like, I mean, there are some, there's some sociolinguistic theory that, that tries to say in this kind of situation, you should just describe the set of the entire vocabulary in somebody's mind as their language, like without dividing it necessarily into Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. And then you, or you might want to, just divide registers up as varieties of language. Like, I mean, I'm not sure about that, but I just wondered what you thought about about how language worked. And then the the, the question for Ida was: In it seems that I'm troubled by the fact that it, it seems much easier as part of what we're doing in this conference to take a theory like Georgiani's, where he's talking about affect and syntax, just like you know, Helen Wendler is talking about affect and syntax in, in Seamus Heaney, that seems much easier than the kind of epistemologies you're dealing with, where, I don't know, it, it seems harder from where we are to take, to take on board an epistemology of the face that works like the one you're dealing with works. Like, I mean, how do you like, how do you confront that, that challenge of taking that on board, as it were? I want to say that uh, uh, my object of the study, Nesimi's poetry, it, uh, it is not uh, some kind of appropriate for both European, Eurocentric uh, theory, and I would say even for uh, Giorgiani or uh, Ibn al Mu'taz, Qudam ibn Jafar. Because uh, if you paid attention during my presentation, I was using the words uh, embodiment, metamorphosis, uh, 
like uh, comparison, compare it, because uh, in uh, this is some kind of um, unconscious mind of poet to think about things. Uh, this is uh, expression of union, union God human being, uh, sacred books, and uh, macrocosm, universe. They are uh, consist uh, like Vahdat, Vahdat al-Wujud. And uh, therefore, devices of, uh, they use devices of Balagh, uh, yes, they use, but uh, given them uh, inner meaning, symbolic meaning, uh, we, we have to confess that uh, some uh, speak, uh, some specific features uh, was opened by Giorgiani about metaphor, and it is being a part of human everyday life. Metaphor is not confined only to literature. We see metaphor uh, as uh, then Lakov said about that in our everyday life. Uh, metaphor has a, a meaning. Uh, in the meaning and uh, it um, connected to magna. Yeah, that, uh, therefore, uh, we see a lot of metaphors uh, uh, and other. But I, uh, I say uh, in Hurufi Sufi poetry, uh, even tahyil wa ta'lil overwhelmed uh, <laughs> most used uh, devices rather than metaphors. Ta'lil, tahyil, because this is poetry of uh, philosophical imagination. I, I don't know if I <laughs> explained or not. <laughs> So to um, answer the question as sort of succinctly as possible, so there's a misunderstanding of the purpose of elevated Turkish as at least in the uh, end of the 16th century, because it's so much is shaped by a number of prejudices in European scholarship and also the way modern Turkish historic historiography, at least in the cohort by the time Mustafa Ali, I mean, they believed that Ottoman or, or elevated Turkish was going to be, and, and then I argue in the book that it's, using the Bordelian term of different linguistic markets is to actually combine it and to offer a universalist lingua franca even to its Arabic speaking subjects. Learn a little bit of Arabic, learn a little bit of Turkish and you can participate in higher culture. Now, um, so ultimately it fails for obvious reasons, but so, and although you have people, so there's a there's conflict between Arabia, and of course the scholarly language is still in Arabic, so all the uh, bibliographical dictionaries I mentioned is still in Arabic. So as a language of film, you still have to produce in Arabic, but when it comes to poetic art, it's Persian. So that tension never disappears. So one way to think about this is what um, Philly asked, is how once if there's this canon through the biographical dictionaries of creating authoritative figures, how is it received in the larger what we might call literary public, if not a reading public per se. So there are two ways to look at that, because we have more sources in the 17th century. One is to look at anthologies, both mejmua defined as anthology, as something, as I mentioned, that's canonical, pedagogical versus personal miscellanies to see, and also looking at multilingual miscellanies. So to look, see how, how it's actually understood in a broader level than what the int intelligentsia wanted to project because ultimately it's a particular point of view. So I had a larger project, which is a problem now because of what's going on in Syria, too, and also it's about access in Dar al-Qutub to look at stuff that exists, because there are multilingual mejmua in Dar al-Qutub that I know of. And to think about, so, so it's hard talking about reading versus privileging texts, right? There's certain texts that are, there's certain Arabic poems like Ibn Fadid's poetry, Imru Qais, that's always part of uh, anthologies. Whether the collector actually read it or not doesn't really matter, but it's what they privilege. So these are the kind of questions I'm thinking about the newer project. Um, it's really about language still becomes a major issue, and rhetoric's part of that because what's interesting in the 17th century is that there's a concern about rhetorizing language again. So there's a well-known example that Hatice Einer writes about in the Cambridge History of Turkey. There's one poet who goes, who goes back to older Turkish works, meaning just from the mid early 16th century, century, and starts replacing the Turkish words with Persian and Arabic to make it more rhetorically valid. And they change titles and what have you. So 
So there's always, so you can't separate, like it's clear that the Ottoman literati identify the basis of poetry as Belagat and that's still Arabic. And they're still thinking about, when we talk about the Fen, they're really talking about Bedia. So they don't care about Me'ani because it doesn't really work in Turkish, right, syntactically, just Turkish, you know, as Leila put it, you can't do a subject-object-verb distinction. So Bayan, they see it as, as an Arabic elm, and they think, you know, as Persian it would be Badia. So that still works. So I'm like, these are questions I'm interested in too. It's like, how do you historicize it? Because there's a tendency just to talk about, you know, I'm not interested in that. I, so the so harder problem is trying to date these miscellanies. Uh, so I've talked, you know, so I've, you know, I'm working with people who work on codecology, who work on sort of binding techniques that I can give a more specific dating. Uh, because, I mean, we can talk about like 17th century, so what? I'm more curious about what happens in the first quarter, the mid the period. And because there's a reaction by the end of the 17th century where Turkish writers said, this is enough. It's become too Arabic and Persian in certain ways. So, but the beginning, there's this, they want it to be more, you know, more elaborate. And it's also just a marker of social distinction and cultural, you know, what have you. But, you know, these are, these are the kind of questions I'm interested in. Because otherwise, how does rhetoric work actual in practice, right? Not just at the theoretical level. Because we can talk about, it's clear to me that no one really read, <coughs> yeah, they couldn't, it's clear to me that it, Telkis is a hard text for someone who's not properly trained Arabic, and they're also having competition with ulema from Egypt, from Damask. So there's competition. So the Ottomans are never really worried, and ultimately people forget, yes, they're interested in Persian poetry, but their immediate competitors for jobs are Arabic speakers, right? And that never disappears, you know. So they can always claim, we know, we can read Jurjani better than you can. Whether they can or not, but it's a rhetorical ploy, right? So that's really, thanks. More questions? Thank you all for a really wonderfully interesting panel. My question is to the last speaker. Um, I found your connection between um, sort of skin and human and parchment and so on, what you called metamorphosizing the human being into divine scripture, really interesting. Um, at some point later, you made reference to the logos, but I didn't quite catch it. And I guess my question would be, could we, would it be a stretch to kind of think archetypically of what you're proposing here in line with the word made flesh in, in, in a Christian kind of sense? Could one draw such a connection, do you think? Microphone. Can you please repeat your, uh, I didn't quite catch. Do you think that there is some kind of archetypal connection uh -huh. between uh -huh. the notion of the word made flesh and what ah, you've yes. just described here? Yes, Because you yes. did mention logos, but I didn't quite catch yes, where you were going with uh, that. Yes, because as I mentioned, uh, Bashar, uh, Bashar uh, then uh, Adam, Adam, of, of course, uh, this is uh, all uh, archetypes, uh, archetypes of human, human mind, and uh, then this affected Hurufi poetry. This poetry appeared in uh, Azerbaijan, in Caucasus, via different uh, religions intermingled, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, ancient uh, Zoroastrian religion, besides that, uh, uh, of course, Islam. And Nasimi spent part of his uh, life in uh, Syria. In, he was uh, executed in Aleppo, uh, and uh, via this uh, practice, uh, was uh, skin and alive, was practiced. Um, maybe, yes, this is connected with archetypes, with the theory of Jung. Uh, we, can, uh, we also can see um, uh, impact of uh, uh, unconscious of Freud. Uh, this is some kind of poetry connected to me uh, to so many uh, streams of philosophical thoughts that we cannot uh, um, uh, we cannot just see only one influence. But this is very. This has so many different sides. The Hurufi thought. Therefore, uh, yes, this is connected. Connected to the uh, ancient uh, speculations of skin, may, maybe I think so. And there's one question in the back. Yeah, uh, so I have a question to Mark as well. 
long list, I'm sorry. Um, so the question that, to Su Yong is, uh, do you think that the persistence, let's call it persistence, uh, of uh, Persia in the 17th century uh, can be also connected to the way, to, to the, let's say, informal ways of, of how Persian uh, was instructed? And also, uh, <coughs> I mean, you also were, were talking about kind of the disconnect between uh, prestige and actual uh, the true practices, right? But also, so I, I want to uh, to hear more about the how Persian was uh, uh, instructed. Uh, and to Mark, I mean, uh, how do you uh, sort of do you uh, how to say uh, conceptualize? Of, you know, how much was this whole thing Nevi's personal agenda, and how much was this uh, part of broader uh, uh, processes? Ferenc, I'll answer that question quickly, but um, Ron made it very clear the pedagogical tools to learn Persian. Um, <clears throat> what's, what I'm more interested in what happens when there's still this interest in producing a better rhetorized Turkish in the face of new of the Taze Gui that comes from India. So there, so there are multiple things happening here. I'm tr still trying to figure out how to talk about them. I was curious to look at the text of Riyaz al-Shuera when all the Persian citations, I thought usually it would be Jami to Nazami and all this other stuff. And once I actually started trying to track down the verses cited, in fact, a lot of them are contemporary. So they're quite aware in 1609 that there, <coughs> there's a new kind of style of poetry that's coming out, not from Safavid Iran, but from, from India in particular. And that, <coughs> and they also, and to me, that's why I think that um, Ankaravi chose a particular text that's associated with the Deccan, in Mahmoud Gavan, that, that this is the kind of stuff they're looking at. But at the same time, but we know as well that the early 17th century, this period where there's <laughs> also Arabized a lot of, a lot of these older Mesnevis or what have you. So, um, and so I was going to add that when, whether or not the work, Ankaravi's work, in fact, is a response to, um, you know, what's coming out of Mughal India, and what Leila talked about, uh, Mazandarani, sort of Persian translation of the Talqif, which I just Googled, is really of the Mutawil by Tafdasani, whether there was a renewed interest in language period from the Persian side as well, from this early 17th. So there's a lot going on here, right? And about, so how do you, we talked about, so there's, there's a lot of translation, so to speak, happening here. How do you actually talk about that in a meaningful way? Because we have a problem with biographical materials in the 17th century. So one alternative, as I mentioned earlier, is looking at um, anthologies, personal, miscellaneous, what have you. So, okay. you know, Murat can talk more about that. Because I think what he's doing with the Bahar Ma'arif, that needs to be a critical edition, needs to be put out and translated, because that's incredibly important as a pedagogical tool in the 17th, 16th century. We have tons of manuscripts for it, so. Uh, just, uh, I, I just want to add something, you know, um, following the um, uh, So Young's comment. Like, he, he talked about Riyazi. I, I think w one significant uh, information that we should remember regarding Riyazi and his career is that he's an Ottoman Persianist. So he was an acclaimed teacher, uh, an instructor of Persian in Istanbul, and he has a work, Dusturul yes. Amal, I think, yeah. So it's all about teaching Persian. So that's why he places special emphasis on the language. And this is very typical of, of Ottoman Persianists. They tend to, you know, see Persian in place. It, they tend to have a hierarchical structure of languages. I mean, that's very clear. Is there also Ottoman Arabic system? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean... Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think there is a great misunderstanding with Nabai's agenda, you know, because uh, modern European scholars, uh, modern Turkish scholars, modern Uzbek scholars, always trace upon that Nabawi promoted Turkic language to the rank of Persian language, and so it was a great model for the Ottomans. Yeah. But uh, what Nabawi wanted to do, you didn't, didn't want to create a special system for Turkic, Turkic language. He wanted to include, it, to include sorry, Turkic language into the Arabic Persian uh, cultural system. So, to do this, he had to persify Turkic language. 
that the way it worked. And it was the same problem for the Ottoman, it was the same problem for Fuzuli. If you want to make poetry with Turkic language, you have to put an, lots of Arabic, Persian words. You have to fit them into the mold of Arus. So it was Navoy agenda, and that's how we can understand Navoy. Is a promoter of Turkic language and it's a major pacifier. And we will we will see the, the the following with the Ottomans. Maybe I ask you. Well, we're uh, 15 minutes over, so it, um, we could continue this discussion over coffee. Thank you so much for the longest panel of the day. <laughs>